Uh, I, I think that's uh, very much the case, that many of these stories are about the art of detection. And the protagonists in, these, in the stories in The Devil of Sherlock Holmes are often sleuths themselves, even if they're not professional sleuths. Uh, there's a story about a con man who suddenly suspects he may be uh, being conned. Uh, there is a story about scientists trying to unravel the mystery of this kind of semi-mythological creature, the giant squid. There's a story about a, a working class uh, detective who is investigating whether a postmodern Polish novelist may have planted clues uh, to a real murder uh, in his novel. And in the Sherlock Holmes story, uh, the main character, who is, is great Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes scholar, is found dead in mysterious circumstances. And he had become obsessed himself with trying to write a biography, by trying to tell the story and piece together the narrative of Conan Doyle. And in the process, is driven slightly mad. And so in that story, you have both the story of uh, the protagonist trying to unravel the mystery of Conan Doyle and who he was, and kind of be his sleuth and his narrator. And to some extent, I am the narrator and the sleuth, uh, the Watson and the Holmes, for Richard Lancelin Green as I try to tell his story and figure out uh, what he was after, what he was searching for to try to unravel the mystery of his character and also to find out why he was garroted in mysterious circumstances. And so how do you sort of go about researching a story like that, that when you come to it, the, the, the story is called Mysterious Circumstances, where nothing is really clear at the beginning of how things worked out. How do you map your way through mentally, physically, through the research, through the writing, um, and come to your conclusions? Because that, that story ends very neatly as a, as a Sherlock Holmes story might. Yeah. I mean, uh, in that case, uh, and in almost all the reporting cases, the stories often begin with just a, almost a clue, a, a tantalizing clue. And I'm sure this is probably true of Malcolm, too, where uh, you hear somebody say something. Uh, in the case of the Sherlock Holmes, uh, somebody had mentioned just in passing that the, this great scholar had been found dead uh, in mysterious circumstances. And that, in its loan, it was just very tantalizing. Uh, and so at that point, I begin to try first to read what there is in the available literature about Richard Lance and Green, but then it's kind of trying like a treasure map to kind of go from one person to another person or one document to another document. So it's trying to first penetrate Richard Lance and Green's inner circle who knew him, who could tell me about him. In that case, what was so interesting is that the case had been taken up by all these amateur sleuths who all these Sherlockians and Conan Doyle scholars who saw this case as a real life mystery that was greater than anything which Conan Doyle had invented. So they were all working the case in their own way. And that allowed me both to try to follow them as they investigated the case and make sense of their discoveries. And it also allowed me, which I try to do in these stories, is to kind of go into a world that you wouldn't ordinarily see, a subculture, a hidden world. And in this case, who knew that there were these people who were utterly obsessed and fanatical about Sherlock Holmes and, and Conan Doyle? Well, before I ask Malcolm the next question, I want to, they're so obsessed that there are actually two sets. Of yes. Can you explain that? Yes. Again, who knew that the, there, were, there are two clubs, there are the Sherlockians, who uh, pretend that Conan Doyle does not exist. and. Uh, therefore, we'll never refer to him by name. And Sherlock Holmes is a real character. And in fact, they uh, produce more scholarship than probably all these books in this bookstore. Uh, one person said, never has so much been written for so few. And uh, the level of this scholarship is to try to look at the stories and basically prove any inconsistencies to show that they're true stories as, as opposed to uh, fiction. And then the Conan Doyle scholars are those who recognize Conan Doyle as the author and creator of the Sherlock Holmes uh, canon, as well as other books, and uh, are his scholars. The thing that was interesting about Richard Lance and Green, the protagonist of this story who was found dead in mysterious circumstances, he was one of the few who went back and forth between both groups. So he was by? He was, yes, by something, yes. <laughs> Uh, but uh, what I wanted to ask you, Malcolm, um, is in, in David's book, uh, The Lost City of Z, he writes about the search for this lost city in the Amazon. And he talks about one person who he met in the 90s, I think, whose name is James Lynch, I think. And, and what he says is that he was drawn into intellectual as well as physical quests. 
in order to illuminate some little known aspects of the world. And so it seemed to me the difference, but the similarity between what you do is yours is sort of the physical, on the physical trail of people, and that you're doing that same kind of intellectual trail of people. So what do you think of that? And how do you think of yourself as a reporter well, detective? I'm, I'm totally lazy here. <laughs> I, my method means I can write my stories without leaving my apartment. <laughs> and, David has to go to the Amazon. <laughs> I would no more go to the Amazon than I would go to the moon. I've always you know? said Malcolm is much smarter than me. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and uh, <laughs> no, no, I meant I didn't mean. Well, I'm sorry, I was referring. To, <laughs> I was referring to your comment. I didn't say I was. Now, what would you say if you read that? Um, I, no, I, um, I, um, did I answer the question? Or did I, or did I just humiliate myself? No, I mean, I guess the, the way that David was talking about coming up with there's a tip or something, yeah. you said that you come up with your ideas because you'll, you sort of become obsessed with something or you want to figure something out. And so yeah. I guess just the intellectual quest that you're on to sort of figure out how people work. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny, I, you know, I grew up on, on speaking of, of Sherlock Holmes, um, I grew up on a kind of steady diet of British murder mysteries. That's all I read for, in fact, that may still be all I read, really. I mean, <laughs> you go, you know, you go into the, into the Hudson booksellers at LaGuardia and all those, you know, all those paperbacks on, I read every one of those. Um, and, some of my earliest memories of my father reading Sherlock Holmes stories to us. Um, and Dorothy Sayers and G.K. Chesterton, Father Brown, and Agatha Christie. I mean, I must have read 50 Agatha Christie books by the time I was 10. So that's sort of my home form. Um, but I can't write fiction. So, I, you know, so what do you do if you love mystery stories and you can't write fiction? Well, you, you write some kind of um, facsimile, um, uh, which is which is what I do, sort of non, you know, non-fiction mysteries. Um, but the minute I think I can write dialogue, I'm gone. Uh, <laughs> so was that a struggle in writing outliers where you say that you made an effort or you, know, you made a conscious effort to concentrate more on people on, on, as opposed to the experiments that, or the social experiments, psychological experiments that are in Blink and the tipping point? I mean, was that yeah. harder then? Yeah, I mean, it, it, um, I did not, I wanted to stop being, I wanted my writing to kind of be a little less chilly. Um, and um, so I was, I, made, I had made a very conscious effort, partly actually from reading people like David and being so taken by his writing and thinking that I should go in that direction as well. Um, uh, made a conscious effort to write more about, um, about people and their stories as opposed to kind of theories and their theoreticians. Well, and, and your book, What the Dog Saw, is divided in very similar ways to David's book, The Devil and Sherlock Holmes, into sections. I mean, so it opens with profiles, or it has a number of profiles. I mean, so what do you do when you come to the dialogue there? How do you make it sound real? Uh, well, you could read them, and you might say that I don't. Sound real. <laughs> uh, but uh, there isn't a lot of... My profiles typically don't involve a lot of time spent with the person I'm profiling. Uh, you may notice this if you read them, that... We quickly move on to other things. Um, in fact, once one of the profiles, what they are. Yes, the profile that begins what the dog saw is my profile of Ron Peel, and I am so accustomed when profiling someone to really just talk to them for a couple of hours. And he proved so chatty that I ran out of. It was back in the day of, you know, tape, cassette tapes. I ran out of tapes, and I had. To, and it was so embarrassing to say to him, "I thought you'd only be good for." two hours, but in fact, you could for more than that, that I had to make up an excuse that I was, had a doctor's appointment, and I got my car, I was in LA, drove, you know, drove all the way down the hill, because you have to drive like, you know, five miles to get to any place to buy anything in LA, and bought cassette tapes and came back and resumed the, the interview, so that was a rare case of... You would think he would have had a gadget on hand that would have worked. Yes, you would have thought he would have a tape-o-matic of some kind, yeah. Well, well, David, I mean, the going back and forth between you. Well, I guess actually, Malcolm, I wanted to ask you. I mean, you you were saying about, or I, I might not, or people might not find the dialogue convincing. 
I read, and I, I forget exactly where it was, that you made a distinction between persuading the reader and engaging the reader. That you want to engage the reader rather than persuade them. Oh, it's, it's, it's persuasion and, and convincing. Um, so this is a, a distinction, not that I didn't make up, but rather it's a very famous distinction in sociology. Of course, the name of the sociologist who came up with it, I've forgotten. But, um, <laughs>